Friends, welcome to a, another episode of Leadosophy. I'm excited to be here again today. I hope you are just as excited as I am. Quick uh, sip of Life's Elixir here. I can't run Leadosophy, the show of Leadosophy, without coffee. I'm getting to some heavy subjects, deep subjects. I need my full attention, and the stimulant of caffeine is, is my fuel. So today I want to talk about values. Uh, this show is going to be about kind of a deep dive into values and the assumptions that lie, be lie behind them. I have a Harvard Business Review article that I want to just briefly touch on. I have some things I wrote up, kind of my own reflections. But I got a little presentation uh, that I want to quickly run through. It gives you an idea of what I think about values and belief systems and how they can help us as a leader or even throw us off course in leadership. So I hope you like today's episode. Remember, Leadosophy is about an open mind, right? That's the rule here. All Leadosophy is keeping an open mind in hopes that we can deepen our understanding of, of leadership and life. You know, this is about leadership, you know, kind of narrowly, but in a more general sense. Leadosophy is about, you know, life in general. So I hope you like today's episode. Here we go. Are you ready to permanently fuse leadership and philosophy? Then a word of caution, you are about to enter the fully abstract yet wholly concrete realm of leadosophy. Our ideas are not always so clear and distinct. To validate this proposition, we welcome the host of leadosophy, Tim Wood. Okay, welcome back, everyone, Leadosophy fans, Leadosophy followers, and just Leadosophers in general. Welcome back. So you can see up on the screen, I have an article titled, How Philosophy Makes You a Better Leader, written by David Brendel. This article is a few years old, actually six years old to be exact, 2014. I want to dive right in because this article actually caused me to take a step back which I think is good in the world of leadosophy. Take a step back and reflect on some of the values that I believe I hold dearly. I believe they govern my actions in life and I believe they govern my actions in the workplace. So here we go. David writes, the goal of most executive coaching and leadership development is behavior change. Help the individual identify and change the behaviors that are getting in the way of and reinforce the behaviors associated with effective leadership. But what about the beliefs and values that drive behavior? He goes on. The benefits of introspection and reflection on one's own character and beliefs receive less attention in a typical coaching session than the benefits of behavior change. Perhaps this is not surprising in our fast-paced and technology-driven business world. And he talks about going on, you know, we're, we're searching for immediate outcomes. And I think it's important to understand that Leadosophy does not believe in immediate outcomes. Immediate outcomes are, are hard to come by. Leadosophy is about exploring deeper meanings and focusing on life changes you know, changes that affect you in the leadership, in a leadership capacity over the long term. There are no shortcuts. I believe there are no shortcuts. And improving one's leadership skills, technical skills, it's a consistent pursuit that improves over time. And you have setbacks and you have all these different things. So immediate outcomes, uh, kind of antagonistic to leadosophy. The author continues, despite growing recognition of the benefits of mindfulness activities, such as yoga and meditation, in an introverted style, self-reflection on philosophical issues, such as values, character virtues, and wisdom, is relatively neglected. What do you think about that, friends? Do you think we neglect self-reflection on philosophical issues, deeper issues such as values and virtue? Possibly. Maybe some of us do. Maybe some of us don't. Uh, he goes on to say that executive coaching and leadership development programs rarely include much, if anything, about the power of clarifying one's philosophical worldview. 
but there is mounting evidence that they should. And this is where we get into some of the, the theory that Leadosophy really likes. You know, we talk about practice, reflection, and theory. How do we square the practice with the theory? The practices that we have in place, do those practices, are, or are those practices backed up by theory? And he brings up some neuroscience research, which is interesting. David writes, neuroscience research on self-reflection supports this notion about self-reflection. A recent study reported in BMC Neuroscience revealed that a critical brain region, the anterior cingulate cortex, the ACC, was activated during self-reflection tasks. The ACC is essential because, as the researchers noted, it can detect discrepancies between the actual and desired state, mediate integration and evaluation of emotional and motivational and cognitive information, and modulate attention. Activating the ACC via self-reflection, in other words, can promote business success by helping leaders to identify their values and strategic goals, synthesize information to attain those goals, and implement strong action plans. And the author goes on to talk about different philosophers and you know different uh, worldviews of, of philosophers and how those can help change your behaviors. Again, he brings up a he brings up a an example of a CEO that has poor behavior in the workplace is negatively affecting those who work for the CEO, and he brings this idea in about how philosophy can immediately change his behaviors and how that can impact those in the workplace. I don't know. I wasn't super happy with the with the example. I mean, it is an example, a, a real life example, nonetheless. But what I wanted to highlight about this article is, again, I was able to self-reflect on my own. And I came up with a, uh, it's kind of like a little monologue I I wrote up. So you can see the reflections, you know, my own self-reflections and and how I came to certain values in my life and into the world of leadership. So this is a critical examination. This is a critical examination of my values and some of my beliefs. Our values have stories behind them. Our values are underpinned by a chain of reasoning. And that reasoning can be rational or irrational. And our reasoning processes may be methodical, and they may even be sudden. Speaking of sudden rationality, ask anyone who's been recently diagnosed with a terminal disease. Ask them if they value time and family and good health. Many of us take seemingly no-brainer values like this for granted. I do. I do it all the time. We all have a shelf life. How often do we ponder or reflect upon our own mortality? How often do we go about our daily lives looking through the lens of finite time and not the lens of, I can't wait for tomorrow to arrive or hashtag for 2020 to be over? Anticipation undermines the value of time, the value of the moment in time. Here and now is all we have. The past is no longer. The future is undetermined or yet to be. So Leadosophy believes that we, can, we should turn to leadership, which is a value in its own right. We're going to talk about leadership here. The first line of my leadership philosophy is lead humbly. This is a principle a principle that I try and live by, although I am not always successful. In two words, a value is implied in my leadership philosophy. Through lead humbly, the value that is implied is humility. I value humility, but why? Why is the deeper question here? Why do I value humility? I ask this reflectively. Reflection brings clarity. Sometimes it brings confusion. But Leadosophy believes that reflection should deepen meaning and not find an absolute truth per se. Again, our values have stories behind them. Our daily practices and experiences, our reflections, our grasping of the theoretical. For example, our theories about humility in leadership, coherent with what we observe in the real world. The way we act and treat others and the reactions we get in return. 
What is the coherence between humility and practice and humility in theory? Our life experiences shape our values. I've said this before. The author of that article said it as well. I spent nearly 20 years in the world of maritime search and rescue. Saving lives alongside my colleagues and my teammates is a, is a dynamic process. Often great risk is involved, skin in the game as they say. The consequences of failure can be high or life extinguishing in rare circumstances. In the maritime environment, for example, rescuing those in peril on the seas requires a team effort. Rescue teams must work in harmony. Everyone has a job to do. No job is worthless, and we place no great importance on one job over another. I believe that the whole equals more than the individual parts. In the workplace, this means that collectively, and by collectively I mean things like shared values, shared vision, shared goals, cohesive and effective teams, sharing of information, right? This is what I mean by collectively. This means that collectively we can achieve more. We can accomplish our missions together as the collective. This also means that I should place less importance on my role or make less of a deal about my role individually. I believe that self-centeredness runs counter to the theory that the whole equals more than each of our individual roles in isolation. And there may be examples that counter this. This is just my thoughts, my reflective thoughts. I also believe that team members like working with others who are not self-centered, who do not have large egos. When I downplay the importance of my position and my role, I seem to place more importance on my teammates, and I believe they react favorably to these actions. There are academic studies that back me up, studies that verify the effectiveness of humility as it applies to teamwork. Again, theory is important. Leadosophy believes theory, practice, reflection, this blend is very important. Intuition and experience often align with theory. Other times they may not. Lastly, I seek to co-create reality, co-create meaning, and co-create knowledge. I do not claim that I own any of these privately. I have but one perspective. I am acutely aware of how inaccurate my perspectives are can be, how it can lead me into error, lead me astray. Humility grounds me. It reminds me of my unique and extremely narrow perspective. Humility elevates the importance of the perspectives of others. So there you have it. That's my brief analysis, my reflective analysis of humility, kind of what it means to me, um, why it's a deeply held value, and kind of how that fabric got stitched together. Uh, I, you know, just opened my reasoning process to you. So I encourage feedback. I encourage scrutiny on, on the value of humility. Uh, maybe you have some different ideas of what humility means to me. So if you can't read the screen, if you're my, one of my audio listeners, I have two definitions up here that I think are very important for deepening understand, understanding of values and principles. Values are defined as the principles that help you decide what is right and wrong and how to act in various situations. That's from Cambridge Dictionary. Principles, a basic idea or rule that explains or controls how something happens or works. So a lot of similarity in those, those definitions. For me, a value is, and I'll show this here in a minute, is a value is something that leads to a principle. And I think it could be vice versa. The principles I have, you can tell what my values are based on my principles. I think they're kind of symbiotic concepts. So again, for my audio listeners, I have up on the screen a slide titled, Values Are Diverse. We value people and things. We value concepts and ideas, traits and behaviors. I think a deeper question for this episode, and I think what the author of that Harvard Business Review article was getting at, a deeper question, why do we hold these values? Where did they come from? What is the origin of our values? So I have three different categories up here. I have things, concepts, and traits and behaviors. 
So we value things like water, food, shelter. We value capital, exercise, clean air, Bojangles the cat, fruit and vegetables, junk food, electronics, alcohol, tobacco, firearms. These are things that we all value. Someone values one of these tangible things. They're concrete things, right? Concepts are different. You know, we're talking more abstract concepts. We hold these values. We hold values like love, beauty, time, power, control, freedom, capitalism, or communism. We value things like, or concepts such as wisdom, altruism, egoism, utilitarianism, right? Utilitarianism is a, is a philosophical concept that it's the greatest good for the greatest amount of people, right? That's how we should craft our public policies. What gives the best, the most benefit to the most amount of people? That's utilitarianism. We value concepts like good health and happiness. What about traits and behaviors? So this goes, what do we value in people? Maybe people that we model, maybe people that are role models for us, maybe mentors in the workplace, leaders we follow. Do we value the humble person, the courageous person? Do we value someone based on their physical appearances? Do we value the competent person, an inspiring individual? Do we value someone who is quiet? And if so, why? Good listeners, resourceful, informative, reliable, punctual, knowledge-seeking, and team players. These are all traits and behaviors that people have that we may value or not value. We may value these traits or behaviors for different reasons. Again, the question remains, why do you specifically value these ideas, these traits and behaviors, and these concepts? I have a note up here on this slide, and I think this is really important because it gets to kind of, I think it gets to the very core of why we value what we value. So Leadosophy believes many values are means to other ends. Those ends being an increase in pleasure and happiness or a decrease in pain, misery, or suffering, right? I believe those are ends, ends in themselves. And we value things because they are life-sustaining. So the question for you out there, friends, leadosophers, what do you value for the sake of itself or for the sake of its utility? For example, if we look at water, right? Water is a thing. Why do we value water? Do we water value for the sake of valuing water? No, we value water because it is life-sustaining, right? What about capital? What about money? Do we value money in itself? Well, money's useless if it's just sitting there, right? If it's just sitting there, even the idea of having money as a retirement option or having money for future use, it's being used for something. We are forecasting what we're going to use it for in the future. Money, capital has utility. They have utility, right, for other ends. What are those ends? Maybe those ends are happiness. Uh, let's talk about concepts. Why do we? Why would a leader in the workplace value power and control? Think about that. And think about the leader who values power and control. How do those values govern their actions with others? Maybe you've worked for the leader who values power or values control. And you see what that can do to the team dynamic. You see how that can affect the organizational culture of a workplace. Is it effective? Are power and control effective values? Maybe, I guess, depends on the situation, right? What about the leader who values wisdom, this idea of wisdom? Do we value wisdom as an end in itself or for some utility that wisdom provides? Again, we're diving deeper into this idea of wisdom and the values that flow from wisdom as a value in itself. Another slide here for our audio, audio listeners. And I hate reading slides, honestly, in, in the day-to-day -day course of events because people can read the slides, but maybe some people listening. I have some notes on values up here. Uh, values are our guidance system. They govern how we lead. They govern how we lead in life. 
in the business arena, in our communities, what have you. So values are systemic, right? We accumulate a constellation of values over time. We develop this value system, right? Over time, we add values to the system. We may jettison values. We may realize some values are, you know, just not working out for us. And I think that goes to the next note on values. Values are competing or they can compete with one another. So how do we reconcile a competition between values? It's a very important question. I don't think we can answer that right here. I think it is important to note that if we have a competition between values, we can, I think we can make the argument that it's going to be very contextual, situational type event where we have to decide, okay, what do we value more, right? Do we value X over Y or Y over X? And I think that's going to guide our conduct. I think we also, going back to the pleasure pain concepts, I think there's this idea between short-term pain, short-term pleasure, right? And long-term pain, long-term pleasure. You know, we, we may value junk food short-term, right? A short-term pleasure, but that can provide long-term pain, right? What about exercise? We can value exercise, right? It may bring us short-term pain, but hopefully we're seeking to, to gain long-term pleasure. So different ways of looking at, at that competing values, short-term versus long-term pain and pleasure. Values are dynamic, kind of my next note on values. Our values will and can change over time for a variety of, of factors. We mature, we mature emotionally, right? Our values change as we mature. Life experiences can change our value system, can alter our value system. Maybe it's a negative life experience, maybe it's a positive life experience. Maybe it's just a life experience where we learn something. How many values have we acquired through faulty logic? That's an important question. How many values have we acquired through faulty logic and faulty information? A lot of bad information out there, right? A lot of bad information. The last note I want to talk about here on values is they are emerging. Values emerge based upon something, their assumptions, their beliefs, um, values emerge through modeling others. Values can emerge authoritatively, right? We are told that something is a value, right? And again, values can emerge through good and bad experiences. I have a note, very note at the bottom. Leadosophy believes that a healthy balance or a healthy diet of practice, reflection, and theory helps us refine and calibrate our value systems. So again, this next slide I have up here, this last slide, I, I, I created this slide based on my, my leadership philosophy, right? And I have, and again, if you're not, if you can't see the screen, I have four values up here, right? And the title is Leaders, Values Make Us Different. That's the title of this slide. We all have different values. We all have similar values for different reasons. I call this the law of unique experiences. Right? We all have a, a unique experience. It is our own. No one else can have it. Each leader has a, his or her own unique experience that can never be replicated, ever. So what are my four values? Right, Humility, um, collective knowledge, human flourishing, and empowerment. Right, Those four values led to my, my basic philosophy principles, those four values alone. Lead with humility, empower others, uh, learn collectively and flourish together. Those four principles that are on my, part of my leadership philosophy flowed from those values. So I talked about humility. Why do I value humil humility? Um, this goes into assumptions. You, ev everything I read to you about um, how I reflectively came to this idea about humility, there were assumptions laced all through what I read to you, right? Some of those assumptions may be faulty, right? That's why I encourage people to challenge me on my assumptions. But if we go to the value of crowdsource knowledge, 
what value does crowdsource knowledge bring to my life and to others, right? I start asking questions about how I came to the value of crowdsource knowledge. Same thing with empowerment. Why do I place a high value on empowerment? And do I value empowerment as an end in itself or a means to something else? You know, if I think about that, I believe it is my assumption that if I empower others, others will um, be able to take whatever ideas they have and allow them to come to fruition, right? It doesn't have to be my idea or it doesn't have to be, you know, my knowledge that makes something happen, right? I think empowerment works works best when your teams are effective. Again, just assumptions, assumptions I have about teamwork and empowerment and how empowerment helps the team. I could be wrong, right? I'm, I'm open, to, again, I'm open to criticism. And again, collective human flourishing, I value flourishing collectively as humans. And I kind of ask the question, is there a difference between human flourishing and flourishing collectively? I think we all pursue our own ideas of happiness. I think we have to do that individually. You know, what brings happiness to one person does not necessarily bring happiness to the next person. So I think it's important to pursue individual happiness, but also nothing we do can happen in a vacuum. All of our successes happen with the help of others, right? We have had others help us along the way in some form or fashion, whether it's showing us the right way, giving us some knowledge, information, whatever, or just giving us an opportunity. So I'll kind of end this with uh, Leadosophy likes taking values, which you see here on the screen or may not be able to see my four values. I take these values and I create principles that guide my conduct, whether they guide my conduct in life, they guide my conduct in the world of leadership, whatever, right? Principles, principles become a part of leadership or life philosophy. So I know that was probably a lot to take in may not have been super exciting. I enjoyed talking about this stuff because it, again, uh, allows me to reflect, self-reflect. It allows me to square some of the things I've seen in practice and some of the theoretical ideas that I have read in the academic setting, in leadership books, whatever, you know, philosophy books. And I can continually to refine my ideas and my values that I believe that I hold very dearly and I'll make this last point. Some of the, the values that we hold so close and so dear, I think it's important to, to understand that we could have acquired those values or those beliefs in error, right? I believe that. So that's the final thought on today, on today's Leadosophy program. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember, Leadosophy is about using the tools of philosophical thought to deepen our understanding of leadership and life in general. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching and listening to another episode of Leadosophy. If you liked what you heard today, hit that subscribe button and check out leadosophy.com and learn more about Tim's ideas on philosophy and leadership. We'll see you next time.